Good day, this is Jim Pytel from Columbia Gorge Community College. This is Digital Electronics 1. This lecture is entitled Boolean Laws. What we're going to try to do is use some of the Boolean Laws that we're just about to learn here to ultimately simplify our logic circuits. Because I've previously mentioned you don't want a number of gates out there that are potentially consuming power when we could just go ahead and simplify our logical circuits to smaller numbers of gates with smaller numbers of inputs there, potentially thereby reducing the power requirements and the physical footprint of a device. One of the analogies I like to use when we discuss Boolean laws is a Screema or Arnis. So this picture here is of Anancio Anciong Bacon. He's one of the grandmaster, well, the original grandmaster of Balintalawak uh, Self-Defense Club. What Arnis and Screema are characterized by is numerical patterns for attacks. You get your six count, your 10 count, your 12 count, sometimes 16 counts. What they are is areas of attack on the human body, which do incredible amounts of damage. And rather than calling them different names, he just called them different numbers. And you could memorize these patterns incredibly quickly, and you could find counters to those patterns. The deal is, since his time, Arnis and Eskrima have split up and gone a number of different ways in different schools. And the deal is, some schools have 12 count that are different than the other 12 count. And some schools have 16 counts, which are different than the other 16 counts. Ultimately, they're all kind of doing the same thing, but they're doing it in a different fashion. Same thing with Boolean laws. I'm going to refer to 12 Boolean laws. Okay, There are some people out there that teach them as 10 Boolean laws. Some people out there will teach 12 Boolean laws, but not necessarily in the order that I teach them at. So if you go ahead and memorize rule number one, and 1 through 12 and you're just walking down the street and you love rule number 6 and you see some digital electronics nerd from a different school and be like yo dude high five rule number 6 what do you think and that guy's gonna look at you like what are you talking about rule number 6 is for nerds I'm a rule number 9 man you can think of them in numbers but when you're talking to somebody else out there don't use the numbers okay that's all I'm saying is uh, we're gonna go over a bunch of laws and like I said sometimes I've thrown some bonus laws in there that are not necessarily official but extremely helpful first before I do that though you guys remember these the commutative the associative and distributive properties I went over that in our multi-level logic circuit exercises and um, rehash those things with the NANs and the NORs I actually want to review those things real quick because it's pretty essential for our later discussion here. So let's go ahead and uh, set up a commutative and see if, uh, if you remember that. And there's our commutative property, the AND gate, meaning A and B is equivalent to B and A. In written expression form, A and B is equivalent to B and A. Commutative property, the OR gates, A or B is equivalent to B or A. No duh. Okay, let's move on. Commutative property is super easy. Let's talk about associative property. Here's a picture of the associative property for AND gates. What is this really trying to say? It's saying A and B, ANDed together, ANDed with C, is functionally equivalent to B and C, ANDed together first, and then ultimately ANDed with A. It's kind of like multiplication. You can multiply 2 times 3 times 4, or 2 times 3 times 4, or 3 times 4 times 2. Okay? Kind of, again, one of those no-duh properties. There's also the associative property for ORs. All you do is just flip those ANDs for ORs, and that's the associative property for ORs, saying that A or B, then ORed with C, so A or B or C, is functionally equivalent to B or C, ORed first, then ORed with A. So A or B or C, which, if you remember right from our three input OR gates, it's equivalent to A or B or C, all taken simultaneously which finally leaves us with our distributive property, which doesn't necessarily bl uh, lend itself to uh, visual analysis like the other ones did, and it actually helps to write the expression out. As soon as you write the expression out, you, you instantly visualize what's going on. You're, you can instantly figure out what's going on. Picture is not necessarily so much. What is this guy's AND gate? Well, it's an A ANDed with a B. And what's this guy's AND gate? Well, it's taken A ANDing it with a C. Finally, what is that OR doing? it? It's A and B OR A and C. Notice the common term. That's exactly what this picture, uh, picture on the right is trying to do. A ANDed with the results of that OR, which is B 
or C. And what I'm doing is distributing that A into those terms inside the parentheses. So if I was to do this as AB or AC, they are functionally equivalent. You can do this both ways too. It may help you once you've got an expression like this, A and B or A and C, to simplify in this direction. It may help you to go from the and of the output of an OR back into kind of an SOP, and feeding an OR implementation. Depends on how you apply this one. So the distributive property, which we're going to go into um, a little bit later with one of uh, kind of the bonus Boolean laws here, it's pretty essential to know when to use it and how to use it because, again, it's double-edged sword. You could be using this wrong. You can make it more unnecessarily complicated when your goal was to, in fact, simplify it. We have gone over the associative, excuse me, the commutative, associative, and distributive properties again. Let's go right into our Boolean laws, and I'm going to call this one Rule 1. Okay, remember, it's not everybody's Rule 1. Let me go ahead and clean this up. So Rule 1 is, you know, I've written this wrong right here. That's Rule 1. Let me go ahead and uh, do my uh, quick typing over here. Okay, so I've corrected it. I don't know if you noticed that one right there was actually incorrect. How I like to teach these Boolean laws is to beat it into your head like a 12-count Arnie's. Head, head, elbow, elbow, stomach, clavicle, clavicle, knee, knee, eye, eye, head. I'm going to give you 12 different ways to prove this rule one, and you're going to get so tired of it, but you're ultimately going to be convinced. Okay, one of the ways is think about it. A times zero is equal to zero. What's six times zero? Zero. What's two times zero? Zero. What's three times zero? Zero. Just think about it mathematically. If you can't think about it mathematically, think about the truth table. Because so there's our, our uh, two input AND gate, A and B are its inputs. Output is X. B I'm going to tie to zero. What are the possible combinations I can get? A could be a zero. A could be a one. What's zero and zero? Zero. What's one and zero? Zero. Rule one has been proved via the truth table. Just think about it again. What is the output for an AND gate? What is it? It is high when all inputs are high. There is no time in this truth table when all inputs are high, therefore its output is zero. Okay, you want further proof? Let's go ahead and do a timing diagram. Okay, so here's a timing diagram set up for rule one. So what we're going to do is use our description for the AND gate. Output is high when all inputs are high. Input B is never high. What you get for your output? Flat line zero. So sometimes it, tell, it helps uh, to view these from different perspectives. Think about multiplication. Think about the truth table. Think about the description for it. Think about the timing diagram. Okay, which leads us to rule number one. Or excuse me, rule number two. We already just did rule number one. Okay, so rule number two states A and one is equal to A. Think in terms of multiplication, because that's kind of what an AND gate is. Six times one is one. Two times, oh, six times one is six. It still is. Two times one is two. 3 times 1 is 3. Okay, It's not changing there. Think in terms of the truth table. A can take the values 0 or 1. If we're ending, let's call that a second input, B, what does the output X look like? The output is high when all inputs are high. Nope. Yes. When A is a 0, X is a 0. When A is a 1, X is a 1. Sounds to me that X looks a lot like A. Okay, go ahead and convince yourself using a timing diagram. Okay, so here is B taking the value of a constant high. What does A look like? Chances are it should look something like this, which looks startlingly similar to A. Between this input there, 0 and 1 is a 0. Now it's they're both high, so you get an output high, and so on and so forth. Rule 2 states that A and 1 is always equal to A. So let's move on to rule 3, which may not be as intuitive as these first two. So rule 3 states a and A is equal to A. The math kind of runs out here. The mathematical examples kind of run out. Because A times A is A squared, right? So we're going to have to think of, again, in terms of the truth table. In terms of the truth table, A is our input. And let's just do our... Typically we're thinking of in terms of A and B are our inputs. What we're doing here is we're tying the inputs together and feeding A to both inputs. What does the output x look like for a two-input truth table? I know this seems kind of weird, but what are the possible... Uh, the truth table looks a little weird, but it's, it works. What are the two possible cases, uh, two possible values a can take? We can take either 0 or 1. So when a is a 0, what's a? 
and it's not a trick question. It's also a zero. When a is a one, what's a? A one. So what's the output of an AND gate? The output is high when all inputs are high. Right there. Nope. Check it out. That looks a lot like a. Go ahead and prove it to yourself in a timing diagram here. So the timing diagram shows a and a on the two inputs. Okay, the output is high when all inputs are high. Right there, right there. You do the timing diagram, your output looks a lot like your input. Which brings us on to rule four. Rule four states a and not a is equal to zero. So it takes a little bit of thinking about this one. Set it up in a truth table. a and not a. Those are our two inputs for our AND gate. a can take the possible value of zero or one. When a is zero, what's not a? One. When a is a one, what's not a? Zero. The output of an AND gate is high when all inputs are high. Nope. Nope. The output is always a zero. This is like, I mean, dealing with a four-year-old. You got chicken in the refrigerator. What do you want to eat? I want to eat a burrito. You're like, okay. Then you got a burrito in the fridge. And you're like, hey, what do you want to eat? The kid's like, chicken. Okay, so it's never going to work out. What does the output look like here? Okay, the output of an AND gate is high when all inputs are high. No, 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 no. Let's move on to rule number five. So we kind of exhausted the rules for the AND gates. Let's go ahead and actually review these real quick here. So the AND gate rules are, I'm going to kind of divide them up into little compartments. So you can not just remember all 12 of them at once, just remember, okay, the first four deal with AND gates. AND0, always equal to a zero. AND1, always equal to A. AND A, equal to A. AND not A, always equal to zero. One, two, three, four. Okay, now pause for a moment here. What if I was to give you an expression that had a logical expression, x is equal to b and b. How would you simplify it? And some of you guys go insane because you say, well, rule number three says a and a is equal to a. He said nothing about b's. Guys, come on, be flexible. I'm saying a is a digital data signal. It can be orange and zero equals zero. It could be banana and one equals a. You get my picture? What I'm saying, a is a thing. It's a digital data signal. I could say c and zero is equal to zero. I can say d and one is equal to d. Now check this out, guys. I can say not b and not b. What's it equal to? It's the same thing, not b, because that's what that rule three is implying. Something ended with something is always equal to that same something. And again, I can do the commutative properties here. Not a ended with a is always equal to zero. Not m ended with m is always be equal to zero. So be flexible with these rules and to what those variables represent. Okay, so we've kind of done the first four. Those all deal with the ands. What you think the next four deal with? Ors. Let's go over each one of those in turn. Okay, rule five is very similar to rule one, except we're just using an or now. A or zero is always equal to A. And this makes sense mathematically. Two plus zero is two. Three plus zero is three. What about the truth table? A can take the value zero or one, and our B input, it's constantly tied to zero. The output of an OR gate is high when any input's high. Nope, yes. What's the output X look like? It looks a lot like A. Think about it in terms of our timing diagram. The output is high, and this is B right here. It's constantly hooked up to zero. The output is high when any input's high. Notice the similarities. So let's go ahead and clean, it up, clean this up for rule six. Okay, rule six is very similar to rule two, except we're just using an OR. A OR one is equal to one. Why is that? Because in OR gate, the output is high when any input's high. Look at B. B is high. My output should probably be like that. Let's clean this up for rule seven. Actually, let's, uh, let's talk about the truth table for this one here, too. Forgot about that. A can take the value 0 or 1. What's the B input? It's constantly tied to 1. The output is high when any input's high, 1, 1. OK, let's go ahead and clean this up for rule 7. And rule 7 is very similar to rule 3, except we're using an OR gate this time. So it says A or A is equal to A. And don't read this as a plus, A plus A. You know, that's kind of confuses you. We're dealing with Boolean addition right now, so which states A or A is equal to A. From the terms of the truth table, if that's our A input,
and our other input is a, a takes a value of 0 and 1. What does the second input take? Well, when a is a 0, a is a 0. When a is a 1, a is a 1. The output of an OR gate is high when any input's high. There you go. Nope. What's this look like? That looks like a. Go ahead and do this for the timing diagram. a or a. The output is high when any input's high. There you go. Why would you ever do something like this? Why would you ever take an OR gate and have an A on the input and an A on the input just to get A out? You know, this OR gate is consuming milliwatts of power every precious second. Just do this. Run a single line right straight to something. So what I'm saying is you're simplifying, you're removing some unnecessary components. Okay, let's clean this up for rule number eight. Rule number eight is very similar to rule number four, except we're using an OR gate, and obviously we get a different result of it. So it says A or not a is always equal to one. And this is awesome. This is like one of those times when you open up the refrigerator, you got a chicken and burrito, and that four-year-old cannot go wrong. Think about it. In terms of the truth table, when a is a zero, not a is a one. When a is a one, not a is a zero. The output is high when any input's high. High, high. You can't go wrong. In terms of the truth table, not a is a one. There you go. A is a one. Not A is a one. A is a one. Okay, you can't go wrong. You always got a one in the output for rule number eight. Let's go ahead and clean this up for rule number nine. And rule number nine, actually before we get into rule number nine, let's just go back here. So we did one through four, which kind of all deals with ands. We already did five through eight, which all deals with ors. Let's go ahead and refresh those guys there. So A or zero is equal to A. A or one is always equal to one. A or A is equal to A. A or not A is equal to 1. 5, 6, 7, and 8. So that's stomach, stomach, or excuse me, stomach, clavicle, clavicle, knee. You might, somebody else might refer to them in different ways, but I just kind of like to think of them as we got 1 through 4 for the ands, 5 through 8 for the ors. There's really only one rule dealing with the knots. That's rule 9, and it is so easy. Rule 9 states, the negation of a negation is what you're originally started with. This kind of makes sense. Think of it in terms of two inverters. If I started with A, I inverted it to not A. And if A was a 0, well, it's not A, it's a 1. What comes out the other side of that second inverter? A 0 or A. I haven't changed it. If A was a 1, what comes out the first inverter? A 0. What comes out the second inverter? A 1. A. It makes sense. Think about this in a timing diagram. If I start with A, I invert it, invert it again, what do you get? You're right back where you started. Bonus easy rule. You cannot forget rule number nine. In reality, if you were to do that with an inverter, be aware that there are subtle uh, shifts in this. For example, it may take a second or millisecond or nanoseconds for that to actually fully complete itself. See what I'm saying is there's a little glitch state right there. There's a little glitch state right there. And the same thing goes for that second inverter. There is a little glitch state there and a little glitch state there. And if you keep on stacking these things up, you're going to get a bigger and bigger, bigger glitch state. Is that advantageous or disadvantageous? Depends on how you use these things. This potentially, we'll go into this later, might be used as a positive edge detector. Think about this. You have a not get with a significant amount of delay. So significant that this input A, not A, and A is being fed into this AND gate here. At that moment in time, its inputs are both simultaneously on. Granted, it's a super brief blip in time. What that's referred to is it's detecting this positive edge. Don't worry about that so much right now. That's going to be more sequential uh, circuit stuff, which we deal with a little bit later. but kind of a cool reality check for some of these things. Yes, you would think that not not A is equal to A. In brief moments of time, there's some weirdness, especially when you cascade these things. Enough about rule number nine. Let's go on to the remaining rules. And we've done one through nine. I'm actually going to skip 10 and 11, my versions of 10 and 11, because they're kind of hard. Well, not terribly hard, just a little bit harder than the other ones. And let's actually just jump to rule 12. Rule 12 is pretty cool because it makes use of the distributive property and something we call the FOIL method. Remember that back from the bad old days of algebra? First outer 
inner last. Let me go ahead and set this thing up for the FOIL rule. So there's rule 12 statement and what it states is A or B anded with A or C is equivalent to A or B and C. It's a neat rule because it makes use of the distributive property and some of the properties that we've thus far discussed and it's a great jumping off topic to some of the uh, examples that we're going to be later on. So how do you simplify these equations? Remember like I referred to earlier the FOIL, first, outer, inner, last. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the first two terms. This is kind of like the distributive property. We're distributing the, uh, the things inside the parentheses w within each other using the FOIL. First is A and A. Maybe there's a rule out there that deals with that one. Outer, so that's our F. Outer is A and C. That's our O. Inner, B and A. That's our I. Or B and C. That's our last. First, outer, inner, last. Do you see anything in that foil that maybe has something to do with the rules that we've already discussed? So you may be tempted at this time to go ahead and say, hey, I'm going to apply one of those rules. Look at that. I got an A and A. That looks like rule number three. What you're going to do, you're going to take your pencil and erase it and put that thing right there. And I'm going to reach through that monitor and slap your hand. Don't do that. That's a surefire way to get lost. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to do this every single time. Give yourself a trail of breadcrumbs. You just distributed it. Tell yourself, I just distributed it. I just foiled it. And then keep that what your result was. Keep that result. And then move on to the next one. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell myself, hey, I have applied rule 3. A and A is equal to A. A or A and C or B and A or B and C. Okay, I'm kind of giving myself, hey, in case I mess up from step 2 to 3, I can always go back to step two and figure out what I originally came up with, figuring out where I went wrong. This is crucial to your learning these things to figure out where did you step off the path. What is our result here? We've got A ORD with A and C, ORD with B and A, ORD with B and C. Do you notice something out there? Maybe something to do with the distribution property? Think about the A right there. There's a lot of A's in there. There's a, this one's got a common A term, this one's got a common A term, that one's got a common A term. Okay, what's that rule? Well, maybe we could distribute that A out. And I'm going to distribute these guys out first, because that's easy. And again, commutative, I can do whatever I want to. C or B. Or, how do I distribute the A out of an A? Isn't there a rule out there where A and 1 is equal to A? So I'm distributing. Okay, and I know I switched the order of these things. I may, I may actually just redo that here for you because that may, may have been a leap of logic for some folks. So I'm going to take the A out of everything. One or C or B. This one doesn't have any A's in it, so I can't do anything with it. B and C. Okay, do you see what I just did? I distributed the A out. I'm taking that distribution property in reverse and just check your work. Did you do it correctly? Distribute it back in. What's A and 1? Well, A and 1, according to one of our rules, is equal to A. That's rule two, by the way. So you get A, or A and C, or A and B, or B and C. So I just went, I distributed, distributed back. I'm checking my work. Did I come up with what I originally have? Yes, you don't need to do that. I'm just illustrating to you what I did. Can I distribute, excuse me, I just distributed the A out. What about this right here? Is there any rule that we discussed thus far that maybe has to do with a one or with something? Go back up, A or one is equal to 1. That's our rule 6. Wait a second, I don't see any A or 1's. I see 1 or C or B in that block. What if I just said C or B is something? What if I said that rule A or 1 is equal to 1? What if I said that block or 1 is equal to 1? Anything ORed with a 1 is always a 1. Okay, so I'm using that rule 6. Giving myself that breadcrumb. Rule 6, A or 1 is equal to 1. What do I get? Everything that parentheses goes to a 1. Looks like we've got another setup right here for rule two. A and one is equal to A. Giving myself that breadcrumb. Finally, B and C. That proves the fact that that is our result right there. You don't have to do this every single time. You can know, you can recognize this pattern. You don't have 
to go through all these procedures here. And that's why I'm saying this is kind of one of those bonus Boolean laws. Some people don't teach it this way. It's because it's using distribution rule 3, distribution rule 6, and rule 2 all together. It's a combination of these things. But it illustrates a way to solve these things, giving yourself kind of that breadcrumbs all the way through. And it illustrates recognizing these patterns. How does this thing look? How does the expression A or B ended with A or C look in comparison to the thing on the right? So let's go ahead and draw that circuit using the logic gates. And this is what I come up with. A or B, A or C, A or B ended with B or C is functionally equivalent to that our immediate value is B and C, A or B and C. You got one gate, two gates, three gates, one gate, two gates. So you simplified it into this thing that's going to use potentially a third as much power as the original. And it's going to have substantially less wiring. I've got two connections two connections to an AND gate, two connections to an OR gate, one output. Here I've got two connections to an OR gate, two connections to an OR gate, two connections to an AND gate, one output. This one right here is going to be substantially easier to wire and potentially save you money on hardware and power. One quick note about this thing here is who's just recognizing these patterns. When I say A or B ended with A or C is equal to A or B and C, I could just as easily write something like this. D or not C ended with not C or E. Does that follow the pattern? What is the result of that? Just go to the shortcut. What I'm looking for is common term. There's a common term different term, different term. What's the common term here? Common term, common term, different term, different term. You can do all the stuff that I just did. You can distribute it, you can foil it, you could rule three, it, you could rule six it, you could rule two it, and you distribute it. Ultimately, you're going to come up with common term, or with different term, different term, and it together. So what is our result here? We should get not C or D and E. Go ahead and see if you could potentially even work through that thing again. Do the foil. Recognize some of these rules all the way through. Lastly, but not leastly, regarding uh, rule 12, here's a timing diagram. Does the expression A or B ended with A or C equal A or B and C? Here's how you do it. Do that one, put it on a timing diagram. That one, put it on a timing diagram. Or them together, get that result. Do that one at a time in a diagram, or it with this one, that result. Do these guys equal each other? I already talked about the timing, excuse me, I already talked about the illogical implementation. Less power, less wires, less devices. Just think about what I just described there. This one is a lot more complicated to do on a timing diagram than this guy. And ultimately, I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording and give you what the result should look like. Either way, this implementation or this implementation should have the following values in the timing diagram. And you should get this as a result. And you know, start visually thinking about these things too. Is this is a simpler expression for you to think of in your mind here. When is it high? When A is high? Or when both B and C are high? When A is high? When B and C are high? When A is high? Or when both B and C are high? It's simpler to even think about that, a simplified equation. We have done one through nine. We did a little diversion up to rule number 12. Let's go ahead and hit 10 and 11 here, and we'll complete our Boolean laws. Okay, so here's kind of what we've discussed thus far. Notice our gaping hole right here. I'm going to go ahead and knock out 10. So rule 10 states that rule 10 states that a or a and b is always equal to a. And just by the virtue of going through rule 12, you can kind of already see what I'm going to do with this one. There's a common term there. It's a. Why can't I distribute A out? A ended with 1 or B. Give yourself a breadcrumb. Distributed it out. Does this make sense? Does A ended with 1 or B? Is it equal to what we originally started with? Yes, it does, because A and 1, according to rule 2, is equal to A. And A ended with B is AB. So ultimately, we're going to get back A or A and B. I've distributed out the A, and I'm left with A and parentheses, 1 or B, parentheses. Where is this thing useful? I see something very similar to that in rule 6. Well, you say, hey, rule 6 has got an A or 1. It doesn't say anything about 1 or B. Well, check it out, guys. Just do the commutative property, B or 1. Is that closer to that? And when I say A, what I mean is box, something in the box, ORed with 1. 
is equal to 1. Well, that's something in a box. What's it equal to? It's equal to 1. But again, don't leave yourself uh, without a trail. So go ahead and say I'm using rule 6, a or 1 is equal to 1. 1. a anded with 1. What do we get there? That's rule 2. That's equivalent to a. So a anded with 1 is equal to a, thereby proving what we've got here. You can go ahead and put this in a timing diagram if you wish. Here we go, so we've got a or a and b, a taking these randomly chosen values, and b, the same thing. So what I'm going to do is going to say the output is high when a is high, or when both, so that was the first one, when a is high, or when both a and b are high. Okay, when are they both high? Well, they just so happen to both be high in that same window that a is high. Does that make sense? So what does my output look like? It looks exactly like a. All right, last one is rule 11. But before we do a rule 11, this is a this is a common stumbling block for people again, I, and I keep on hashing on it because I know someone's gonna get stressed out about this. What I'm saying is something here has something in common with that thing. With that, what if I wrote something like not n and c or with not n? What is that equivalent to? Something common. That one being anded with something different. What is my result of that? If that one was a, what do you think the common term in this one is? It's not n. So be aware of these patterns. What I'm looking for is those you be able to recognize these patterns with them. Don't think of in terms of must be a, must be a, must be a. It can be anything. I'm looking for the patterns. Rule 11. Okay, rule 11 is somewhat of a bear because it's not exactly the easiest pattern to recognize. So it say it's that a or not a anded with b is equal to a or b. And it's very similar to rule 10 and 12 in the fact that we have to use some multiple derivations to actually get it. And kind of your your thing up front here is to just recognize that pattern. It's something with its inversion anded with something else. Ultimately gives you that original something or with the something else. Using a pattern recognition. If I was to say to you, uh, not c D or D, not C and a D with D, or with not D, what would the result of that be? And I'm purposely making it kind of hard to recognize. What I see is a something and its inverse multiply, it's going to be anded with something else. Okay, what do I get there? I should get that original something or with the uh, not C term in this particular case. So I'm just looking for pattern recognition. Don't know if that helps or not. Let's uh, go ahead and try this. Okay, this is again rule number 11, kind of a PETA, P-I-T-A. Guess what it stands for? Because it requires us to do some derivations. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do a leap of faith. I'm going to use rule 10 to help solve this. If A or A and B is equal to A, that A, why can't I just take this A and put in A or A and B in the place of A? So rule 10, and then bring down the stuff that I have not changed. Now I can um, kind of head, kind of go ahead and look for some other similarities here. I'm not necessarily seeing anything that's making my life easier. But look at rule number three here. I'm taking a leap of faith. What's rule three? Rule three states A and A is equal to A. Kind of like I did with rule 10, I'm going to use rule three backwards. If A and A is equal to A, I'm going to put A and A here and bring down the stuff that I haven't changed. And I'm leaving myself a little note, what I just did. Have I complicated this? Yes. Doing, excuse me, that's why I don't like necessarily uh, this particular role. It's complicated to do the derivation of. All I'm looking for you ultimately in the end is to recognize this pattern and be able to simplify. Let me go ahead and move on to our next step. Okay, if I know that a or zero, if I, just, if I add a zero into there, I'm not really going to change the expression. So I'm going to add a zero into there. Okay, that's rule five. What I should be doing is another step here. I'm going to add a zero, so that's rule five. Why did I do that? It's basically, you'll see, I'm adding zero, I haven't changed it. What's a zero? Well, according to rule four, it's a and not a. I'm setting myself up for a reverse foil. Have I simplified it? No, I've made it more complicated. Trust me, don't worry, we'll get there. I'm going to flip-flop these two terms just to make it so you might be able to see this a little bit better. And now, what I'm going to do is just factor this out. It's almost like a reverse foil. What would the two terms look like if I foiled them to get that? Chances are they would look like a or not a and a or b. 
What is a or not a? Rule eight. I run out of room, so I'm actually going to go ahead and do what I told you never to do. I'm going to put a one there. What do I get? A or B. So if you followed this derivation of this thing, I feel very confident in your ability to do some of these Boolean laws. I'm not asking you to derive these things. We are going to be using them a little bit later, not necessarily in those substitution ways to simplify logical expressions. What would this look like in a circuit? Let me go ahead and clean this up and draw two of the circuits. This is what you get for that first one. You've got not A right here being it anded with B, and that is in turn ORed with A. A or not A and B. What does the second term look like? The logical equivalent is simply A or B. So what I would do is potentially use that intermediary value there, which I'm going to call P, just for lack of a better term. And what you can do is come up with a timing diagram. Let's find a blank one. So here's a blank timing diagram attempted to illustrate what rule 11 is occurring here. So we've got A and B. What I'm going to do is I'm going to draw not A. It's an intermediary value. What is not A? It's the inversion of A. And then what is P? P is not A anded with B. So anytime both not A and B are high. Right there. That looks like the only one. And finally, what we're getting there as our result is A ORed with P. So anytime A is high, A is no longer high, but this guy is. A is high. What does, and that is A or, not A, and B. What's this thing look like? What about just A or B? A is high, B is high, A is high. Why'd you go to all this trouble when you can just do that? Rule number 11, I will admit, it is the hardest one to understand not only the derivation but the pattern. The pattern is a little bit harder than the other ones. So let's go up and review every single one of these things we just discussed. Okay, so rule one through four kind of deal with ands. Rule five through eight deal with ors. Rule nine's a gimme. That's a not. Rule number 12 is kind of the foil property. Rule 10's pretty easy if you think about it. Rule 11, not so easy. What is one state? A and zero is equal to zero. Rule two states a anded with 1 is equal to A. Rule 3, A and A is equal to A. Rule 4, A and not A is equal to 0. 5, A or 0 is equal to A. Rule 6, A or 1 is equal to 1. Rule 7, A or A is equal to A. Rule 8, A or not A is equal to 1. Rule 9, not not A is equal to A. Number 10, A or a and B is equal to A. Rule number 11, A or not A ended with B is equal to A or B. Finally, rule 12, A or B ended with A or C is equal to A or B and C. Say that 12 times fast. And what I would recommend, put these on your cheat sheet. You may even want to put some of the truth table, timing diagram, maybe even some of the derivations on these things because the more you use them, the quicker you can access them, the more they become ingrained in your memory. Because what we're going to try to do is we're actually going to go over De Morgan's theorem, which is kind of closely related to the Boolean laws and simplifications. And we're going to actually go ahead and start applying these things to instantly recognize, hey, we need that gate, or we don't need that gate, or we can just go ahead and potentially even get rid of an input. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is come up with a better logical design that is lighter in weight, cheaper in cost, and less power consumption. Okay, this concludes this portion of the Boolean Law exercises. Let's go over to Morgan's theorems.